say, why would combinations be easier? Because there's one method in <laughs> There's only one way to do a combination part. Okay, the difference is, the question is, what's the difference between a permutation and a combination? Permutations, we're making patterns. Okay, you'll note up here I have combinations are ways to select groups of objects. The difference here is, I'm not making them into patterns. Um, a classic example here is how many three-person committees can be made from this classroom. You're gonna, I need three people to serve on my I Love Math committee to plan I Love Math activities. And I want to know how many three-person committees are possible. Kay. Is this going to come out higher or lower than permutations? Am I going to get bigger numbers or smaller numbers? Smaller. Yeah, smaller. Because now, with a permutation, I would, if I take Joel, Nick, and Randy here, I would have figured out all the different patterns where I can put those three people in. Now I just want to know how many groups of three people can I pick. I can pick those three. I can pick Nick, Randy, and Katie, that's a different three. I'm not putting, I'm not caring who's first, who's second, who's third. I just want to know how many groups of people can I pick. So you're not going to be making patterns. You just want to pick groups of things. You're going to use combinations. It's much simpler. And so <coughs> consequently, since there's only one way to do it, you're going to discover you have also an NCR that you can use as well. It works exactly like the NPR, except when it calculates it, back to the factorials, it divides by an extra number. You have two numbers on the bottom, that's what makes you come out with a smaller answer. So um, let me give you an example here. If I said do 8C3, <coughs> I'd be saying you got eight things you're going to make, actually I was going to do three person committees, never mind. Three person committees here, there are presently today there are 12 of you here. So I would have 12 people, I'm making a three-person committee. What your calculator is going to do is it's going to go, oh, well, that's 12 factorial. It's going to divide by the difference in them, which is 9, but it's also going to keep the 3 on the bottom. I think combinations are easier because the two numbers on the bottom have to add up to the number on the top every single time. 9 and 3 make 12. And once again, if you think about what's going to cancel, there's really not that many numbers left. It's going to be 220. Now, how did I do that in my head? I certainly didn't work all those factorials. Well, I think what's going to cancel? If I write every number from 12 down to 3, 2, 1, and I have here 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, times 3, 2, 1. Well, yeah, aren't I going to cancel everything from 9 on down? So here, 9 on down is going to go. So all I have to do is figure out 12, 11, 10 divided by 3, 2, 1. Okay, in my case, when I did my head, I went, that's 6 on the bottom. 6 cancels into 12, leaves me 2 times 11 times 10. I can do 22 times 10 in my head. That's too funny. So if you think about what's going to cancel, this actually become quite easy to figure out. Yeah, you know, if you get a bigger number, if you get, if this is, 3 is about the biggest I want to do in my head as far as picking 3 objects. If I'm picking 4 or 5 objects, they get tougher. That's too many numbers left over. But they're actually pretty simple. So, why would we care? You, if you are not a card player and familiar with decks of cards, you might want to write these facts down in this corner. I'm not going to expect, if I put a card problem on a test or something, I would tell you these facts, but if you're not sure, can, uh, used to working with cards, you may want to know this. So, so any time in math, if you're doing a deck of cards, they are not jokers. They have to specifically say there are jokers in the deck for you to be doing a problem with jokers. Otherwise, assume you do not have jokers. So normally we work with them being 52 cards in our deck, the four suits of hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. Okay. 
Does this make sense? 26 red cards, 26 black cards, half the deck, half of 52 is 26. Okay, we usually know this four cards is four aces, four deuces, four queens. It's these last two that sometimes we don't know. What do I mean by face card? No jokers in our deck. So it's just jack, queen, king times four suits means there's 12 face cards in a deck. The other one is 13 cards in a suit. I'm talking about how many diamonds in a suit. Well, 52 divided by 4 means there's 13 of each kind. So 13 hearts, 13 diamonds, 13 spades, 13 clubs. So if you're not familiar with that, you might want to do that. I'm not going to do all these. We're just going to do a couple of them. I want to do this top one. If you're going to pick five cards and you have to pick, they have to all five be diamonds. How many different hands of five diamonds can you pick? Okay. You're picking groups here. Are we caring about making these into patterns? I'm just picking groups. I want to know how many different groups can I pick. So this is just a combination problem. The question is, how many do you have to pick from if they have to all be diamonds? Thirteen. Not, you say not picking from all 52. We are not doing probability here at the moment. There will be 13 diamond cards, and how many are you picking? Five. So you would have 13, <coughs> and five, and that would be the end of it. Pause that a second. Where did I throw another piece of paper from class class? Oh, it didn't. So 13C5 turns out to be 1,287. There are 1,287 different hands of five diamonds. Oh, yeah. So if you're trying to get your poker player, that means that's a flush. So there will be 1,287 ways you could get a flush in diamonds. Which also means there's 1,287 ways to get a flush in clubs. You get five cards of the same kind. Big suit. Okay, this, this next one I want to talk about, how many hands with three black cards and two red cards? Since I want some of each, you're going to have to be two separate combinations. And you have to go, okay, black cards, how many are there? 26. How many of them do you want to pick? Three. Okay, times red cards. 26 and you're picking two. So you would actually have to multiply those two together. That if you want you to pick separate things, then you pick it separately, you multiply it together, and you would find out there's 845,000 different hands of with three black and two red cards in them. This is why you won't see any gambling, because I then when you turn that into probability, the chances of getting certain things, these numbers are astronomical. There are 2,598,960 different five card hands you can draw. There's a reason I know that number. <laughs> but, okay, we're going to do a touch of probability here. They scared me last class. I didn't remember this. You guys know the difference between probability and odds? Right. Told me about that. So I'm glad somebody got that. Okay, probability is how many ways you can succeed over the total number to do it, whereas odds is how many ways to succeed over failing. So uh, this is a really strange. Okay, in this this room, if I ask you, let me ask first of all, if I ask you the probability of picking a girl in this room today. There are 12 of you total. How many girls are there then? Ten. Ten ways to speed out of 12, or we would reduce that down to five out of six. Okay. So, what's the difference between me asking you that and asking you the odds of picking a girl? Okay. Now, there are still ten ways to succeed, but then you're doing ways to fail, where you cannot get a girl. So, that would be ten to two, or five to one chance here. So, yeah. Not <laughs> there's really big chances you can get a girl <laughs> in this particular class. So there's a difference between probability and odds, and I cannot get people to keep that straight. So do watch that. Most of the world thinks they're the same thing. And I will next class I'll tell you a story about that. 
Okay, let me show you how probability fills into this real quick. If you're doing probability, I want the probability that I will get three eggs out of my Reese's eggs out of my Easter basket here. You're picking more than one now. So you can't just say it's this many over this many. You have to go, okay, how many different ways can I get three Reese's eggs? How many different groups of three Reese's eggs could I pick? Because I could pick egg one, two, and three, or egg one, two, and four, or... So the point is, you have to do combinations if you're picking more than one. There's six Reese's and you're picking three. Out of total, there's 12 eggs in this basket and you're picking three. If you're picking more than one item, you will have to do it in combination. We're, we're going to do a ton more of this coming. When you actually enter this expression into your calculator, it's going to spit back at you a decimal number. I'm okay if you give decimal answers or fraction answers. If you give decimals, you need three significant digits. Consequently, in this case, the solution would be 0 .0909. The first zero is a placeholder. That's not significant. So you need three significant digits. However, for some problems, you may also want it you need to be able to see it as a fraction. So if you would like it to convert to a fraction, if you go to your calculator, to menu, number, and then choose approximate to fraction, it will change it to a fraction for you and give you the exact answer. In this case, the fraction turns out to be 1 to 11. I could also then take this problem and ask you to find the odds that we would get three Reese's eggs in our Easter basket. But you have to realize that when you're picking more than one item, doing odds becomes extremely difficult because successes is still no problem. It's calculating the failure that becomes a major issue. We can would still do successes the same way. There's still six eggs. We want three of them. But failures is our problem. So failures, there's lots of ways you can fail. We could get two Reese's eggs and a caramel, or two Reese's and a money egg. Or we could get a caramel and two money. Or we could get two caramels and one money. There are so many possible ways to fail that it's a nightmare to calculate. Consequently, please notice the giant cherries written right below here. You cannot calculate odds directly if you're choosing more than one item. You have to always do the probability first, then calculate the odds. So since on this problem we already know the probability is 1 to 11, that's successes over total. So if I want failures, successes would be 1, and I would fail 10, I could fail 10 different ways. So much easier to calculate odds if you've done probability first. You have to do probability first. I can't say that enough. Okay, a similar example down here. Suppose you wanted the probability that you would get two caramel eggs and one money egg. Since you're doing more than one thing, picking two different groups, you're going to have to do two combinations. And you're going to go, okay, I need to pick two caramels. Well, how many caramels are in there? There's four caramels in there, and we want to pick two of them. They also want you to pick one egg with money in it. There are two of those to choose from, but we are only going to select one. And then, of course, probability ends with the grand total on the bottom. So you would go, okay, how many total eggs did I have? Well, I still have 12 total eggs in the basket. And how many eggs did I pick in total? Well, I picked a total of three. So that 12C3 is going to stay constant on the bottom in this problem because you're always going to have the same total amount. Once you actually put that in a calculator, um, you're going to end up with, as a fraction, 3 over 55. I don't have the decimal handy right now at the moment. So right now you have the luxury of knowing if you're picking more than one item, you're going to do combination. We'll make that a little more interesting next time. One last tiny thing that you're going to run into on your, a couple on your assignment, um, and this is more of an assessment thing that I'm hitting you with. Sometimes they want to do what's called geometric probability. 
And in this case, I've given you this diagram with the measurements shown, and I want you to find the probability of hitting the yellow area in the picture. Okay. Well, you simply have to think of it as an area problem. I need to know the area of the yellow. That's what I need to hit, so that's my success, over the area of the whole thing. Okay, well, let's start with the easy one first. How would I get the area of the whole thing? Well, the whole thing's a rectangle. So 4 times 10 length times width would give me an area of 40 square units for my total. On the top, I need the area of the yellow section. Well, that's a little tricky, but you could go, well, okay, the logical way would be figure the rectangle and then subtract out the circle that's inside it. Okay, well, we already know the rectangle is 4 by 10 is 40. Now, the question is, do you remember the area of a circle? And hopefully somebody out there is going, oh, it's pi r squared. Well, what's the radius here? 2. So you would do 2 squared. And then you could actually calculate those particular numbers. Unfortunately, at the moment, I don't seem to have the answer. Let me check here to this particular problem. And unfortunately, no, I don't. So we're probably going to, at this point, just leave it as 40 minus 4 pi then, once I squared that. And you could actually go to your calculator to get the exact probability on that. It's still going to be pretty high because there's a fairly good area there that we're looking at that's already shaded yellow. Okay, so that's your first beginning of probability. Have a great time. Remember, the odds are always in your favor.